How could the one true church place a man like that in power and allow him for eight to nine years to commit these, these terrible acts? Well, I decided to do another uh, Know Your Pope's video uh, today. It's been a few weeks since I've done one, but I've got lots of free time. I'm here um, the day before July 4th. It's July 3rd, and so because it's the day before a holiday, I imagine there's probably not a lot of farmers wanting to load up trucks and bring them in and dump them here. Uh, there was one right away this morning, probably wanted to get out of the way. This is why he was here so early, but there hasn't been anyone uh at all for the past few hours and i've been sitting here and i thought well it's been a while since i did a know your pope's video perhaps i should go ahead and do another one maybe two maybe i'll do two of them today i'm not sure uh but today the pope i wanted to look at is an infamous pope and uh, his name is pope john the 12th pope john the 12th one two uh, so there's been a lot of pope john's um, but you should remember number 12 because even Catholics do not defend this guy it is, uh, because of how bad he was. Uh, but just to cover the basics first, his papacy went from 955 until 964, so about eight or nine years. I'm not sure the months, uh, but 955 to 964 uh, were the years of his reign as pope, okay? Now, he, when he first came into power, he did lead an attack against the Lombards. The Lombards were a group of people in Italy that owned land, and he was wanting to go get land uh, for the papal states okay, for the, of the Catholic Church. And so he personally led the attack. He was on the battlefield, and so this man went and, and saw fighting, and he saw uh, warfare, and he was leading it. But the reason he was doing that was to gain more land and more wealth and stuff for the church, and that's just not biblical. We don't see the church going to war and killing people in order to fill its uh, its its own pockets. Uh, that's just not consistent with biblical Christianity at all. And so to believe that this is the one true church, and then we see that behavior, it causes us to question, gives us good reason to question and doubt whether or not this really is the church of God, and if God really has anything to do with it. That seems very carnal and secular to um, be willing to kill people as a church. I understand nations and governments, that's a different institution. God set up the institution of government. He set up the institution of marriage and the family. He set up the institution uh, of the church, and those are different institutions, and they function differently. So I'm not condemning anyone that's a veteran that served in the armed forces that uh, is a part of the government that way in the military so don't misunderstand me that i'm like against um those of those men and women in our country who have served in the army and the air force and the navy you know etc and the marines uh coast guard now i don't want to forget anybody but those that have served to protect us and uh, to fight our enemies th that's perfectly fine within the institution of the government but the church isn't supposed to you know run like that institution and yet that's exactly what we see going on in the catholic church it's more of a, a man-made government secular entity than it is uh an entity ordained by god and led by god um to fulfill his purpose for the church in the church age i just don't see their behavior lining up with what we read about the church in scripture uh, but he did, other than that, he did very little church business. There's some record of him requiring uh, mass to be done three times a day, seven days a week at a particular abbey in Germany um, in order for him to recognize them. And so they had to, to do that to say prayers for the dead and, and oh, offer up the Eucharist for absolution of sins for the soul and for the souls of future Catholics uh, that would come later. And, of course, that's all unscriptural theology as well. But that was the only type of church business he did, was leading the attack to gain land 
for the church and then also um, getting this abbey over in Germany to do mass three times a day. Uh, so it's all unbiblical and that's all he did, even as Pope. So he doesn't have much of an interest in church affairs because he was having a different type of affairs going on. He's a very immoral man and he's mostly known for being an evil, wicked, depraved man. And so now uh, for the rest of this video, I just go, I'm going to run through a list of offenses that have been recorded by multiple sources, multiple historians. And so it checks out. It's not just one disgruntled person trying to spread propaganda against this guy. There's a lot of negativity out there from multiple authors about Pope John the Twelfth. And like I said in the beginning, even the Catholics have a hard time uh, defending him, and most of them won't. They just flat out say he was not what a pope should be. I forget the the modern his, uh, Catholic historian who is a supporter of the popes and of the, the papacy. Uh, even he said this guy was, was not what a pope should be, and so he speaks out against him as well. Catholics and non-Catholics alike uh, have n just bad things to say about Pope John the Twelfth. Oh, let me make sure... Thought I heard a truck coming, so I wanted to check. Um, so let's run down through this list. Uh, Philip Schaff described him as a monster of iniquity. Philip Schaff was a church historian. He wrote a lot of stuff about the popes and the Catholic Church. And um, when he got to Pope John XII, he said this man was deposed as a monster of iniquity. And, uh, and that's what he's remembered as. And You'll see why. Um, one thing he did was he ordained a 10-year-old to be bishop over a city. Uh, the Bible talks about uh, not a novice, unless being lifted up with pride, he falls into the condemnation of the devil. So that's, uh, you know, I would say a 10-year-old should not be in charge of, of a bunch of churches in a particular region. I believe in the local church, and so you wouldn't have a bishop over multiple churches in a region anyway. But if you have a system set up like that, you don't put a 10-year-old in charge of it. What's a 10-year-old going to do? What do they know about life and and uh, the scriptures and, and spiritual things? I mean, they're, they're still growing up. They're still a child. But he put that child in charge of the spiritual uh, business nature of the Catholic churches in that area, um, in that region. Just made the, a 10-year-old a bishop. Then he was known to hold ceremonies in a barn or ordination ceremonies. He would ordain priests and bishops and stuff just out in a barn. You know, it was nothing special, nothing significant. Um, he would just, you know, pull somebody in a barn and say, okay, you're a bishop now or you're a priest. And uh, so, of course, there was even more immorality and wickedness spreading throughout the Catholic Church because you had people that had perhaps little to no interest in being part of the clergy and he'd just make them part of the clergy and now they have this authority and power as a priest in the Catholic Church and they're reigning that over other people's lives. So, um, it would just spread it, spread the, the wickedness and the evil when he doesn't take what he's doing seriously. Um, he committed arson for fun. People are liking him to Nero. Um, and, of course, there's some debate as to whether Nero started the fire of his day and fiddled. He probably didn't actually fiddle while Rome burned, but that's uh, one of the legends uh, surrounding Nero. But they are liking this pope to Nero because he was known to set fires to people's houses for fun and uh, was a murderer. People would die sometimes, and it was just a funny thing to him. He enjoyed burning down other people's property. And as Pope, he could do this and, and nothing would happen to him. It was unchecked power. And uh, it was abused greatly by this man. Uh, he committed fornication rampantly. He had numerous mistresses, numerous women. Um, even his father was shacking up with a woman. And then he went in and and uh, fornicated with his father's mistress. So his father is immoral and shacking up. And then his son, the Pope, comes in and is also sleeping around with this woman. He committed adultery with lots of married women, and they, they wrote of him saying that he defiled many virgins. He, they lost their purity to him, uh, and he defiled uh, many wives. He turned them into adulteresses. And I, I realize it takes two, but he was using his position of power and influence to uh, take advantage of these women and these, these women that were married and had husbands to take them and to... Uh, have sexual relations with them. Just an untold number of women that he slept with while he was Pope. 
He also mutilated some priests. There were priests that he had murdered. There were others he mutilated. He would uh, castrate them and uh, cut other, you know, parts of their bodies off and things just for fun. He just liked to be cruel and evil um, and, and torture folks. He had something wrong with his psychology. He was a lost man and, and needed Jesus, of course. There's no way anyone could say this man was saved. I see no reason, no fruit. Uh, to say that this was a saved man. He's probably in hell today and he will be burning forever as a result of, of dying in his sins and not being forgiven and not coming to Christ the biblical way and being saved. And so, uh, but yeah, he was just a, a very wicked man that enjoyed harming others. We already talked about the arson and, and now even mutilating the bodies of another human being, another uh, part of the of, of the human race, you know, to to take a person and just mutilate them and uh, and now they have to live with that mutilation the rest of their lives. How can you do such a thing and claim to be Christ on earth at the same time as they believe the popes are? Um, it, when he had meals with other people, even uh, in the sacred palace where the popes live and, and in other functions uh, that would be held in banqueting halls and stuff, he would raise his glass and drink to the health of the devil and he would toast the devil and drink down his alcohol, drink down his wine as he was lifting up the name of, of Satan even uh, in his meals, you know. Uh, in my house, we like to pray before we eat. Well, this guy, he wasn't praying before he ate. He, was not, he wasn't doing anything with God before he ate. He was toasting to the devil. He was raising his glass to the health of Satan as Pope. Um, and then he also would invoke, or he would go through some process, some kind of witchcraft, pagan, whatever, to invoke demons at the gambling table to try and help him win some money gambling. So he was a gambler as well, like games of chance and put, putting money on games of chance and then calling on these demons. And he called on, I think, Jupiter and Venus and, and a lot of other unnamed, unmentioned demons uh, that he would call upon to try and help him win uh, these, these games, this gambling, so he could get money. I mean, this is just completely contrary to anything we find in the Bible about a Christian leader, a bishop, uh, being blameless. He was far from that. I realize no pastor is perfect. You don't have to be perfect to, to have a church and hold a pulpit, but this guy was far off uh, from being blameless. Very, very far off. Hopefully you can see that from this list of offenses I've read off. Now, the last thing I want to say in regards to that is he may have been responsible for the legend of Pope Joan, okay? Pope Joan, J-O-A-N, that is a woman's name. And there's this legend that there was once a female Pope reigning over the Catholic Church. Now, it's never been proven, you know, 100%, uh, and that's why it's considered the legend of Pope Joan. But one reason people think this may have been talked about, may have come to pass, is that... Uh, he had so many mistresses. Pope John the Twelfth had so many mistresses. There were women in and out, in and out of the sacred palace, uh, that there may have been for a time a woman that he would have jokingly allowed to put on the papal attire and everything and sit and act like she was in charge and reigning and giving orders. So there may have been a female in the position of Pope in the papal regalia may have only been for a day or a week or a month as a joke. This guy probably, you know, I wouldn't put it past him with all the other things he did, but he may have had one of his girlfriends um, pretending to be a pope, and from that came the legend of Pope John. I don't know. I just know that that's something that's talked about among Catholic historians, that this pope may have been responsible for starting the legend of Pope John. So hopefully you have seen what a wicked and moral man he was, He's one of your popes if you are a Catholic. I was talking with somebody about, you know, they said, know your popes and stuff. Well, I don't have any popes. If I did, I would say, know our popes, right? I'd say, know our popes, and I would take uh, responsibility. I would bring that in as if it's something I'm associated with. It's not. I have no popes, okay? It's know your popes, okay? This is directed towards uh, the Catholic community, uh, to say that you need to, if you're a Catholic and you claim that, oh yes, the Pope is the vicar of Christ, Christ on earth, you know, the Christ spirit that was in Christ is now in the Pope, and, and all that stuff that the Catholics have taught as they've developed their theology through the years, okay, to develop this, this other Christ, the Pope here on earth, 
Um, if that's what you're going to believe and you're going to be a Roman Catholic and subscribe to Catholicism, you need to know your popes. And I hope after learning about Pope John the Twelfth, you'll question whether or not you really are in the one true church. How could the one true church place a man like that in power and allow him for eight to nine years to commit these, these terrible acts? That's a question for you to ask yourself.